Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our Sea Chains Conversations program for the 50th anniversary of Earth Day here at Princeton Public Library in our virtual space here on Crowdcast. We are really happy to be presenting this conversation on climate change 101 today in conjunction with Sea Change Conversations and the New Jersey Conservation Foundation Rethink Energy New Jersey program. Uh, just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. My name is Janie Herman. I am the public programming librarian at Princeton Public Library, and I'll be here behind the scenes hosting, and I'll be back on later on. Uh, right now, there, you're all over here in a lovely little chat box checking in. Uh, that's great. We're going to turn it off, though, for the main portion of the program, so you can really focus on what our main presenter has to say and the slides that she's doing. But if you want to ask a question, and we do encourage you to ask a question, there is an ask a question function that is available on the bottom of the screen. And so type your question in there. Now, before you ask your own question, check and see what other people have asked. And you can vote that question up so that our moderator knows what questions most people want to have answered. Uh, there's also a little poll that you can take so that we know where you're from and how concerned you are about climate change. And is everybody able to see? Um, us, uh, just type into the box if you're having, into the chat box before we go away, if you're having any problems. Um, Barb Webb is there saying, click arrow on bottom left if you're not seeing the video. Hopefully everybody's here seeing us. We have 93 people on this call, which is just great to have so many people out for the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. So now I'm going to go off and uh, let Tom Gilbert take over. Tom is the campaign director for Rethink Energy New Jersey, um, a part of the New Jersey Conservation Foundation, and one of our great partners for today. So without further ado, here's Tom. Welcome, Tom, and I'm going to let you take it from here. Thanks so much, Janie. And thank you all for joining us on this 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Uh, we hope that you and your families are all staying safe and well, and we're pleased to have the opportunity to talk with you today and, and present this uh, presentation on Climate Change 101 in partnership with the Princeton Public Library and with Sea Change Conversations. This is the first in a series that we'll be uh, presenting in the coming weeks about the climate crisis about clean energy and how New Jersey um, has emerged as a national leader in uh, dealing with the climate crisis and moving to a clean energy future. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Kathleen Biggins from Sea Change Conversations uh, for um, a really a phenomenal presentation that I know you're going to enjoy. Climate change is undoubtedly the greatest environmental challenge of our time, but it's not just an environmental challenge. It's a public health and safety challenge. It's a, a challenge to our a huge challenge to our economy um, and to our national security as this presentation. So um, I think compellingly will show. And Rethink Energy New Jersey is a campaign that New Jersey Conservation Foundation joined with the Watershed Institute and the Pinelands Preservation Alliance to launch about five years ago, ago with the goal of transitioning New Jersey away from fossil fuels that are uh, the leading uh, contributor to climate change to clean and renewable sources of energy like wind and solar that are appropriately cited. And we also uh, work to oppose unneeded polluting pipelines like the proposed Pennies pipeline. And that represents an enormous threat to our land and our water and our communities and our clean energy future. And in our work, we rely heavily on sound science and data as the foundation for our work. And that's why we're so pleased to be able to bring, uh, to help bring this presentation to you today by, by Sea Change Conversations. Uh, as Janie noted, throughout the presentation, you can ask questions that occur to you along the way using that ask a, que a question feature uh, you should see a link to that on the bottom of your screen. I'll be keeping track of those questions. You can also vote on which questions are of most interest to you. And at, at the end of the presentation, um, I will uh, pose as many of those questions as we have time for to Kathleen at the end. 
And so without further ado, uh, further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce Kathleen Bickens, who is the co-founder and president of Sea Change Conversations. So welcome. And I also want to thank Kathleen and uh, all the volunteers at Sea Change for the many hours that you have spent um, bringing this critical information now to, to many audiences around the country. Thank you for what you do. Oh, well, thank you, Tom, and thank you, Janie. We are thrilled to be with you and all of you on the webinar today on this very important celebration of the 50th Earth Day. Um, let me see if I can pull up my slides. Here we go. Hopefully everybody can see the slides. And I'd like to give you a moment um, or a quick recap of who we are to put this presentation a bit into context. Sea Change Conversation is an all volunteer group. Here's a picture of our crew here in Princeton. And we came back together in uh, 2013 when really nobody was talking about climate change. There was very little media coverage about it and there was really kind of a social taboo in discussing it. But we realized that our colleagues and our loved ones and our peers we're not understanding how it would impact them. And therefore we're not part of the conversation about the topic. And so we thought up ways to reach out to them to try to wake them up. The presentation that we are about to share with you was developed to bring out to conservative and moderate associations, things like country clubs and uh, garden clubs, rotary clubs, chamber of commerce, groups that were not yet in the conversation yet would be negatively impacted by this issue. And we've been very fortunate because as we bring it out, people have recommended us forward. And we have now presented in 28 states to almost 10,000 people, all on volunteer power. So whenever we walk into a room to talk about climate change, we recognize that we don't walk in alone. We walk in with three 800 pound gorillas, if you will. The first 800 pound gorilla is the fact that everyone on this webinar, and everyone on this planet knows that the climate has always been changing due to natural causes. We've had crocodiles in the Arctic, we've had ice ages, but this time it's different. Scientists say that after a remarkable period of 10,000 years of stability, man, through our own activity, is triggering a period of instability. And we're doing it at a time when there's seven and a half billion of us on the planet today and close to 10 billion projected by mid-century. And we can't just pick up our lean-tos and follow the food and water resources as they react to a changing climate. The second 800-pound gorilla in the room with us is the fact that fossil fuels have been incredible friends to us. Before we discovered them, our lives were short and brutal. They have given us vibrant economies, and a very high quality of life. But scientists say, if we continue to use them the way we have in the past, they will begin to do the opposite, lower our GDP and lessen our quality of life, especially for our kids and our grandkids. And the third 800 pound gorilla in the room with us is that this is a tough, tough topic to talk about. Perhaps it is banned from your Thanksgiving table. It was from mine for many years. But it hasn't always been thus. Back in the day when George W. Bush became president, he recommended a cap and trade approach to address this issue. There were multiple bills um, cross, supported by both parties introduced into Congress every single year of his term. And in 2007, Newt Gingrich, the conservative Republican um, congressman, did a commercial with Nancy Pelosi recommending cap and trade to address this issue. And in 2008, it was on both parties' presidential platform. Different ways of addressing it, but agreeing that it needed to be addressed. So what happened? Well, scientists who were active during that period tell us that when Al Gore won the Nobel Peace Prize for his movie on climate change and Inconvenient Truth, it was a watershed moment, something that had had begrudging acceptance across party lines was suddenly seen as a liberal issue. And we had a new litmus test of what makes a good conservative 
for a good liberal. And the media at the time didn't help. Those on the far left wrote that in order to address climate change, we had to be anti-car, anti-cow, and anti-capitalist. And on the right, they began to cover it more as a cultural war issue instead of a scientific one. In fact, research shows that in 2006, 50% of the coverage on Fox News said that climate change was real. By 2009, 90% of the coverage said it was a hoax. So a real hardening across party lines. But if you fast forward to today, the vast majority of Americans understand that climate change is happening. And a strong majority understand that it is being influenced by man, kind. But what Americans across the spectrum report is they don't understand how climate change will impact them personally, nor why there is urgency to address it. And that is what this presentation was designed to help with. Now, we are not scientists, but we've worked very closely with scientists and energy policy experts who developed this presentation. And it has been vetted by climate scientists at Duke, at Yale, at Princeton, at Rutgers, and at Tufts. So we know our science is sound. Now, one of the groups that we follow very closely is the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication. And about five years ago, they came out with a presentation that said Americans across the spectrum have five major questions. And we decided to use those questions as the structure for this presentation. So what are the five questions Americans have? Well, the first one is, how do we know it's real? The second, how do we know it's us? The third, what do the scientists think? The fourth, is it dangerous? And the fifth, is there hope? So let's jump into that first question. How do we know it's real? Well, for one thing, we understand the basic physics of greenhouse, how greenhouse gases work. And it has been well understood for over 150 years. Let's go back to science class. When the solar energy comes down through our atmosphere, it strikes the Earth's surface. Much of the energy is absorbed, but quite a lot of it ricochets back out into space. And when it does so, it is at a different wavelength. And this new wavelength is partially captured by a minute portion of our atmosphere, less than 1% that is comprised of greenhouse gases, which are primarily water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. And these greenhouse gases trap those ricochet, that ricocheting energy because of their three atom structure. And they then re-radiate it back down to the surface. Without them, we would have a frozen planet. So they play a very important role. But when we add to them, it simply means they capture more of that ricocheting energy and re-radiate more back down to the surface, warming up the earth and adding energy into our climate systems. Another way to think about this is the balance of carbon dioxide. I think many of us know that there is a balance between plants and animals, but what we may not know is there's also a balance in where nature stores carbon dioxide, in the earth, in the oceans, and in the atmosphere. And I think if we take a look at those bottom two words at the bottom of your screen, fossil fuels, and consider what they are, it will help inform our understanding of this issue. Fossil fuels are little bits of plant and animal matter, perhaps a dinosaur that fell into the muck millions of years ago and got silted over and with time, heat and pressure that turned back into pools of carbon. What we call fossil fuels, oil, natural gas and coal. And humankind came along and said, wow, really rich in energy, really portable, really storable. I'm going to use it. I'm going to use it to heat my homes, to power my transportation, to run my factories, and to build our economy. And life was good. But in doing so, humankind was unwittingly taking carbon dioxide that nature had sequestered deep under the earth over millions of years and started to pump it up into the atmosphere at the alarmingly fast rate of 40 billion tons of carbon every single year much faster than it ever happens in nature. 
And at the same time, as we were pumping all that carbon dioxide from deep underground and up into our atmosphere, we are cutting down our trees, marginalizing our meadows and wetlands, and destroying our soils, which releases even more carbon into the air and makes it hard for nature to rebalance. So how are we putting those emissions up into the air? Primarily through our transportation and electricity sectors, a little less in industry, residential, and agriculture. Though I should note that if we looked at this on a global basis, that agriculture makes up about 24% of global emissions. So hopefully you're with me on the basics of climate change, but how do we know how much of it is happening? Well, scientists are measuring it. They are measuring it every single day at over 10,000 sites from the top of the atmosphere down into the oceans all around the globe. And on top of that, they're adding satellite information. Now you can imagine that that's a lot of raw data to create a big picture from, but luckily for us, there are several institutions in our world that are tasked in doing just that. The Met office over in England, NASA and NOAA in our country, the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts and the Japan Meteorological Agency. And importantly, as they independently analyze all this raw data, they come up with the exact same big picture. And that is that we have heated the earth about one degree Celsius from the beginning of the industrial revolution. Now, one degree Celsius correlates to a 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. And that doesn't sound like such a bad idea on a cold winter's day. But small changes in our average global temperature make for big changes on how we experience life on the planet's surface. We'll get more into that as we go further into the presentation don't let the small numbers fool you. So scientists are measuring it, but they're also observing it. And we can too. Let's take a look at climate change in action with our own eyes. Now, what we are looking at here is a depiction from NOAA showing how the mature Arctic ice is melting away. It starts in 1990 and comes up near current time. The mature ice is depicted in white and it is being replaced by immature ice and open water, which are depicted by light blue and dark blue. Now, the reason why this is so important is that mature ice is highly reflective. It is almost like the windshield screen that we put in our cars during the summer to reflect the sunlight away from our cars and keep them cooler. Well, scientists say we are losing our collective windscreen, which means that we are baking in higher temperatures for the future. It's also important because now Russia has ice-free borders through much of the year, which has geopolitical ramifications, and our Navy has an entirely new, an entire new ocean to patrol which has all sorts of budgetary ramifications. But ice isn't just in the water, it's also on land. Take a look at these two pictures taken at exact same time, exact same place, sorry, exact same time of year and exact same place about 60 years apart. As you can see, they look like they are entirely different planets, right? And this is happening all around the world. In our own Glacier National Park, there were 150 large glaciers when it was founded in 1910. Today, there are only a handful, and they're all expected to melt away in the next 20 years. So we'll have to come up with a new name for our Glacier National Park. So scientists are measuring it and observing it, but they also have another way to tell us how they know climate change is happening. And that is by looking to see how today is different than yesteryear. And they do this through a discipline called paleoclimatology. Paleoclimatologists analyze proxies, things like ancient ice and trees, lake beds and seabeds, and even ancient corals. Perhaps the ice is the most intriguing. These ice cores can go back further than 800,000 years. And scientists like this one are looking for little air pockets that were trapped when snow fell and froze over. And they can liberate those air pockets and discern exactly what the carbon levels were 
going back 800,000 years. And what do the paleoclimatologists tell us is happening? They are telling us that we are in uncharted territory. For the last 800,000 years, our carbon dioxide levels have banded between 150 and 250 parts per million, or 150 up to 300 parts per million. These were through the natural cycles of the earth. As it went down, it was a thaw. As it went up, it was an ice age, ice age and thaw, ice age and thaw. And then in 1910, we crossed out of the normal patterns and out of those normal cycles and crossed over 300 parts per million. Today, we are at about 415 parts per million. And scientists say, if we continue on our current path, we will hit close to 1,000 parts per million by the end of this century. And because we know that carbon dioxide and temperature always work in lockstep, and that parts of the carbon dioxide can last in the air over a thousand years, it means that the carbon dioxide we put up today will impact generations as far out as we can envision. So hopefully you're with me that climate change is real. Let's move to that second question. How do we know it's us? Well, scientists have another discipline to help us understand that, and that is the discipline of atmospheric chemistry. Atmospheric chemists can literally measure which atoms of carbon dioxide in the air come from burning fossil fuels versus natural causes. And that's because they have a, a different isotope, a different atomic thumbprint, if you will. So we can literally measure it. Another way that scientists know that it's us is the fact that when they put everything into the models that normally impacts the climate, that has impacted the climate from the beginning of time on this planet, things like its orbit, its wobble, its tilt, its um, solar radiance, volcanic activity, and snow cover reflectivity, you get this bright blue line. And you see that if nature was left to her own accord, we would be in a slight cooling period right now. But when nature puts into the models our activity, man's influence on top of nature's activity, they get the bright green line and see how closely it approximates the orange line, which is the, what has actually happened and been observed. So scientists say they cannot explain what is going on around us in the natural world without factoring in our influence. And if you consider the fact that if nature was left to her own devices, we would be in a cooling period, and instead we're warming, you can say that humankind is responsible for 100% of the warming. So let's move to that third question. What do the scientists think? And this is a critical question. This is considered a gateway question because very few Americans understand just how strong the consensus really is. In fact, only 20% of Americans understand it. And the consensus is very strong. It is as strong as a scientific consensus that smoking leads to higher incidence of lung cancer, something probably all of us on this webinar would take at truth, as true. Now, we know a lot of numbers are bandied about out there. So we went to a source we found credible, and that is NASA. And on their website, NASA says 97% or more of climate scientists say human-caused climate change is happening. You don't get that kind of consensus in science. But perhaps you're somebody who doesn't believe in individual scientists. So let's take a look at some of the more prestigious scientific associations. Perhaps you will agree with me that the National Academies of Sciences are some of the more prestigious groups. Well, 15 years ago, when George W. Bush was president, and clearly there was no pressure on scientists to say that climate change was happening. All of the leading National Academies of Sciences of the major countries of the world came together to issue a warning. And they wrote, the scientific understanding of climate change is now sufficiently clear to justify nations taking prompt action. 15 years ago. And if you do not think that the National Academies or Sciences are credible, then look to any national scientific group you think is credible. We did for all of these, and it was unanimous. Climate change is happening, man influence, and poses real risk ahead. 
And if you don't believe the scientific associations or institutions, take a look at what the fossil fuel companies are saying. Exxon, the risk of climate change is clear and the risk warrants action. Shell, we recognize the significance of climate change. A key role for Shell is to find ways to provide much more energy with less carbon dioxide. And even the oil and gas climate initiative, which is made up of the CEOs of all the top oil companies, say they support the Paris Agreement agenda and recognize the urgency to address climate change. So if the CEO of Saudi Aramco, Exxon, Shell, BP, and Chevron all agree climate change is happening and there's an urgent need to address it, what are the rest of us arguing about? Now, I'd like all of you to take a moment to step back and think about how you normally evaluate a risk in your life. If you're like most of us, we break it into three pieces. The first part is how likely is that risk to happen? Well, we just saw the Arctic ice melting away with our own ice and heard that the major oil companies are concerned. So I think we can check that box. The second part of a risk assessment normally is, so what are the consequences? Are they ones that we can live with if they come to pass? Or are they ones that we really want to avoid? And the third part of that risk assessment is, okay, so how difficult or expensive is it to avoid that risk? I hope you agree. So we are about to move into that second part of that risk assessment. What are the consequences? Are they ones we can live with or are they ones we want to really avoid? And to do that, we need to move to our fourth question. Is it dangerous? Now, I'm gonna take a moment to orient you on this slide because to me, it is the most important slide of the entire presentation. And that is because it represents the big picture. What we have here on the bottom axis is time from today going back 20,000 years. And on the y-axis, we have temperature in Fahrenheit from about nine degrees colder to about 11 degrees warmer. The yellow line is average global temperature and the white are more or less milestones just to give us a bit of orientation. So as you can see, 20,000 years ago, we were in the middle of the last ice age. The southernmost glacier ended at exit nine on the turnpike just north of our hometown of Princeton. It was a very different planet at that time. But over about 9,000 years, nature moderated and the average global temperature came up to what it has more or less been for the last 60, I'm sorry, for the last 10,000 years as our um, species has really evolved. And that temperature is 60 degrees Fahrenheit, which is kind of a sweet spot for our species and a temperature that the earth hasn't been at very often in its long career or long history. When it arrived at that 60 degrees Fahrenheit, we had the emergence of agriculture. That next little bump was when Mesopotamia flourished. That little hill, perhaps half a degree, was when the Vikings were able to grow vegetables in Greenland. And then we have a divot, which is probably maybe a degree to a degree and a half, which is when the earth was um, subjected to the little ice age and we had great food deprivation and upheaval and war. And then you see that the temperature rises up, landing somewhere between 3.6 and 10.8 degrees Fahrenheit hotter by the end of this century depending on what we choose to do. So let's think about that. 9,000 years for nature to literally march trees from Mexico to Montana to create the ecosystem and the biodiversity that have supported us for the last 10,000 years. And now we, through our activities, are triggering potentially that same delta, that same change in temperature in 100 years. That's scary, right? And that is what brought all of the countries of the world together at the Paris Accord to say, we can't go there. We can't go to those higher numbers. We have to stay below the 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit, which correlates to a two degrees Celsius that we hear in the press, or even better at the 1.5 degrees Celsius, because we think at those ranges, we can handle what's coming. We can mitigate, we can adapt. But above that, we're 
just not so sure. So let's delve deeply into what these eco services and natural systems changes are coming due to climate change. But as we do, I'd like you to evaluate these changes through three specific lenses. The first lens is how will these changes impact our economy and jobs? The second is how will they impact your health and your personal security? And the third is how will they impact your exposure to geopolitical instability, which we experience as exposure to civil conflict, refugee flows, and even terrorism. Now, do any of you out there in the audience know why I'm asking you to look through these three specific lenses? Because these are the three things that Americans report are most important to them when they vote. And we believe that climate change will profoundly and negatively impact all three. So let's see if you guys will agree. Let's move quickly first to heat. And in this graphic from NASA, we will see how the average average decadal temperature has changed from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution to today. When it is blue, it is colder than average. When it is white, it is average. When it is yellow, it is warmer. And when it is red, it is hotter. So as you can see, at the end, the red really comes crescendoing in. And that's because we aren't really breaking rules anymore. We're shattering them. The last 10 years have been the hottest years ever recorded. And last year was the second hottest year ever recorded. But that's looking backwards. What's happening on the ground today? Well, for our friends down under in Australia, they recently added the color purple to their national heat index map because they are routinely forecasting temperature of 125 degrees Fahrenheit. What does it mean for us in the future? Well, this is from Climate Central, which is a nonpartisan group that publishes a lot of information that enables you to see what is happening today and what is forecast tomorrow for your local area. Climate Central took a look at 26 different climate models. So they didn't just pick the worst case scenario. And you can see that they project that if we continue on our current emissions path, our summers at the end of the century will be about nine and a half degrees hotter and feel like summers in Southern Florida. Another thing that Climate Central looks at is something called danger days. It's when the heat and humidity are above 105 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is an important demarcation because it's at that point that our bodies can no longer sweat to cool us down and keep us safe. We know what these days are like because they're excessive heat warnings. We hear on the radio, keep your dogs and your pets and your children and your elderly inside. Don't go out to recreate or to work. There are days that are lost to us. And we don't have many of them up in New York right now. But as we look at what's ahead of us, we can see in the next 10 years, we're projected to have almost over a half of a month where it will be danger to, dangerous to be outside. And by 2050, a full month where it will be dangerous to be outside. The picture is even more um, stark as we go down to our southern cities, some of our favorite cities like Naples and Miami and Orlando and Austin, where Climate Central projects that they will have nearly half a year of danger days by 2050 if we continue on our current emissions path. Now let's think about that. What do you think will happen to these cities when we look at this temperature increase and we evaluate it through those three specific lenses? Well, we know that productivity goes down as heat goes up. We know that agricultural yield goes down as heat goes up. We know that they'll have to build more infrastructure to protect their population. And we know that infrastructure degrades more quickly in high temperatures, so it will be more expensive. So clear hits to jobs and economy in those markets. What about that second one, health and personal security? Well, most of us know that heat aggravates lung and heart disease. And many of us also know that crime goes up with increased temperatures. But what we may not know is that he is the number one weather killer more than any other natural occurrence. 
So I think we can recognize how our health and pers personal security will be impacted. But what about that third lens? What about exposure to geopolitical instability? What do scientists mean about that? Well, scientists say that as hot as it will be in the southern part of our country, it will be even hotter in parts of Central America and further south. And they envision that many people will no longer find those lands as habitable as today. And there will be refugee, refugee flows pushing up against our southern borders, unlike any we've ever envisioned. So clear hits to all three things of those three lenses. But of course, heat isn't just in our country, it's all around the world. As you can see from this graphic from NASA, um, if we continue on our current emissions path, NASA projects that summers in some of the most highly populated areas like the Northern Africa area and the Middle East will average over 113 degrees Fahrenheit. That is the cool of the night averaged in with the heat of the day, which means that it never cools down, which is so deadly for so many species, including our own. And if you consider that the Syrian refugee crisis was, ca crisis was caused by 5 million people being displaced, you can imagine the sort of pressures Europe will face when so many people find their lands so much less habitable. Let's move quickly off of heat to food. Um, this is from the Nonpartisan World Resource Institute, and they took a look at crop yields and how they would be impacted as temperature goes up to a three degree Celsius or a 5.4 degree Fahrenheit increase. And you can see that everything in red means that we lose crop production and green actually increases. And you can see that it's the production centers that really lose out. And if we go to four degrees Celsius or five degrees Celsius, there's no green left on the map. Now, the Wall Street Journal last year uh, reported on a USDA study that showed that soybean and corn yields in our own country could drop 60 to 80% simply due to this increased heat in the middle of the next half of the century, so around 2060 to 2070. So not at all in the far future. And food, of course, isn't just on land, it's also in the oceans. Many of us don't realize that when carbon dioxide mixes with ocean water, it turns into carbonic acid. In fact, the oceans are about 30% more acidic today than they were before the Industrial Revolution. And that's really bad news if you're a creature who makes your shell out of calcium carbonate, much like uh, oysters and clams and some of the things we love to eat. But it's also true for these little preterpods or sea butterflies that are at the base of the main food chain. They feed salmon and mackerel and many fish that are very important to us. And scientists say they are already beginning to be severely damaged by the acidity in the water today. But we're not just acidifying the oceans, we're also heating it up. As this graphic shows, some part of the oceans are already four degrees hotter. And that's really important to storms and hurricanes. Um, we are changing the patterns of these storms and hurricanes by heating up the oceans. And that's because hurricanes especially are nature's way of cooling down her oceans. But the heat also is impacting our coral reefs, which are the nurseries for 25% of all marine sea life. The coral reefs are having these severe bleaching events because the temperature is so high. So I'd like to remind you about when I said that small numbers matter. One of the things that the International Panel on Climate Change report that came out last year said was that if we could keep our temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius, we could potentially save 30 to 10 percent of our coral reefs. But if we heat up that additional two degrees Celsius, they anticipate we will lose them all. So it shows how every smidgen of a degree is worth fighting for, that small numbers really matter. Let's stay on water and take a look at this flood caused by heavy rain. 
Now, this actually is in New Jersey, but it could be anywhere. It could be in Texas. It could be in um, Charleston. It could be in Washington, D.C., Carolina, in Maryland. And that's because of physics, simply because warmer air holds more water vapor. Scientists posit that it, every degree Celsius we raise the temperature of our air, it can hold 7% more water volume, which means that when we have these heavy rainstorms, there's more water to fall down on our heads. This graphic shows that it is indeed happening more all across our country, um, with the most happening in the Northeast. And while we have too much rain, we have too little snow. Precipitation is falling as rain longer into the year, and our snowpacks are smaller and are melting earlier in the spring. And this has real important ramifications for cities and farms that depend on that snowpack for water during the hot growing season. Let's stay on water and move quickly to sea level rise, which is perhaps one of the most frightening and bedeviling of the consequences of climate change. We know we have baked in a fair amount of sea level rise, um, and that is because we know that land ice is melting and flowing to the sea, as we saw in the melting glaciers. And we also know that we are heating up the ocean, which means that it is thermally expanding. The sea level rise to date has been, a, from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, has been about eight inches. The best case projections that we are seeing there's a sea level rise of about a foot and a half to three feet by the end of the centuries, and worst case, uh, as high as eight feet. And again, part of the question is we just don't know how fast it will come and how much time we will have to react. Now, clearly, this has real consequence for our economy. We look to a non-green group called Zillow to get a sense at what might be at risk. And you can see from this graphic that Zillow projects there is about $900 billion worth of property that would be underwater at a six foot sea level rise. Clearly Florida with the 413 billion has the greatest exposure, but soberingly, New Jersey with 93 billion, it has the second most exposure. And you kind of have to look at it on a, a metro level to really understand what that could mean. For our friends up in Boston, it means that they would lose about 18% of their property. In Miami, it would mean losing about a third of their property. But of course, it's not just houses. It's also all of our infrastructure that is at risk. It's our roads, our bridges, our airports. It's also our cyber optics. There is just so much to protect and it will force us to make some very difficult choices. And perhaps you're somebody who doesn't believe in forecast or what's coming down the pike. Well, take a look at what we can see with our own eyes right now up and down our coastline. And that is sunny day nuisance flooding happening simply because of the rising sea level. Now this may not look so drastic to you, but if you are a homeowner or a business trying to function through this, it is very difficult. It's very hard to get property insurance. It's very hard to um, have a car insurance. It's hard to sell your house. And school buses won't come through to pick up your children. It's a real hardship from climate change that we can see right now. Let's move quickly to health. This is from the Center for Disease Control, who has a very um, robust site on how climate change will impact our health. Now, there are a lot of things that we would surmise would be true, the risk of drowning or um, water and soil salinization. But there are a couple of things that really surprised me, including a direct impact on asthma levels. And that is because pollen goes up as carbon dioxide goes up. And pollens are triggers for asthma. And asthma is one of the number one costs to our public health. So we can envision a much greater exposure later in the century. Another thing that climate change exacerbates are wildfires. Our wildfire seasons extend now 105 days longer than they used to before 1970 out west. Now clearly uh, forest management plays a role, but 
scientists say that having the summer-like conditions extend further throughout the year means that when a spark happens, it's more deadly and far-reaching um, than it would have been in the past. Another thing that the CDC points out is that uh, disease vectors, diseases that are carried by pests like ticks and fleas and mosquitoes are expanding because those pests are expanding their geographical footprint and are active longer into the year. What does that mean for us in the New York area? It means that today there are 15 more days that mosquitoes are active and can potentially infect us than where we were exposed to before 1980. And the Centers for Disease Control also says that they anticipate that climate change will create mass population movement and international conflict. So what do you think the CDC means about that? Well, what they mean is when you put these sort of pressures on places with poor governance and weak institutions, it can lead to chaos. But it's not just the CDC who says that. It's our own U.S. Department of Defense who wrote in a report to Congress in 2016 the following. Climate change is an urgent and growing threat to our national security, contributing to increased natural disasters, refugee flows, and conflicts over basic resources such as food and water. These impacts are already occurring, and the scope, scale, and intensity of these impacts are projected to increase over time. And I'd be remiss if I didn't speak to the loss of biodiversity and ecosystems. I'm sure several of you on this webinar are birders. And if so, you may have seen the brand new campaign that the Audubon Society recently put out that says or warns that two thirds of North American birds are threatened by climate change. And it's not just our animals, it is also our plants and our sacred spaces. This is a picture of a place near me where I like to walk my dog. And I hope if I ever get grandkids, I will bring my grandkids there. Nearby, there's a place or a farm stand where I can buy a crisp apple in the fall. But scientists warn that if we continue on our current path, these types of trees may, longer, may no longer flourish in Princeton when my grandkids grow up because they need the cold to survive and they're moving more. And I don't know how to put a value on all of these incredibly iconic and prized spaces all around the world that we are losing. But to me, they're priceless. And all of this adds up to a direct hit on our economy. This is from, this graphic is from the BlackRock Institute, which projects GDP loss due to climate change. And you can see everywhere that is, does not have that little speck of green in it will have their economies hit significantly by climate change. Now, let's take a moment to step back and think about what I just shared with you. I shared with you things that we could see with our own eyes, like the sunny day nuisance flooding and the color purple on the Australia heat map. And I shared with you projections from groups we normally look to to keep us safe, groups like NASA, and NOAA. Are those projections 100% right? Are they spot on? Of course not. They're just projections. And so much of it depends on what we choose to do. The question isn't whether they are 100% right. The question is whether they are credible. Because anywhere else in our lives, when risks this dire are credible, we would take action to avoid them. How many of you listening to this webinar have fire insurance on your homes? I'm sure all of you. Is it because you're 100% sure that your home is going to burn down or because it would be truly catastrophic if it did? And therefore you take the actions to protect yourself. You take the actions to buy smart appliances, to shut your fire doors, to buy insurance. Scientists say the risk of climate change impacting each of you negatively is much greater than the risk of your house burning down, but that we are not according it the same respect. 
Now, I know there are pundits out there who tell us, don't get alarmed, don't get sucked in. Those models, they are so over-reporting the risk. But what I don't read when I read those pundits are about the scientists on the other side of the equation. The ones who warn that we are under-reporting the risk in the models because they aren't taking in the black swan events, things that are less likely to happen, but if they did, would be truly catastrophic. Like what? Like the melting of the Arctic permafrost. We know that when organisms die up in the permafrost, many of them freeze over before they fully decay. But now the Arctic is warming faster than any other part of the planet. And those organisms are beginning to de decay en masse, putting a lot of methane and carbon dioxide up into our atmosphere. And scientists warn that that could cause a feedback loop that humankind could never control. So we have the group who say, hey, no worries, be happy. We have the group on the other side who say, hey, the Titanic could be going down, drink heavily. And then we have the vast majority of scientists in the middle who say, this is a real risk, but there are important actions that we can take to mitigate that risk. And we're supposed to take a bet. And we're taking that bet not just for ourselves, but for everyone else on the planet. And not just for our generations, but for our kids and our grandkids and those even further out. How do we make that bet? What would a prudent person do? Now, I can't see your faces, but I'm gonna guess that you're feeling pretty depressed right now. So we are quickly going to move to our fifth question because Sea change conversation leaves resoundingly, yes, that there is hope. And the reason that we believe there is hope is because the economic equation around this issue has been turned on its head. We now know that the cost of action is much greater than the cost of, I'm sorry, yeah, the cost of inaction is much greater than the cost of action. And as difficult or as expensive as it may be to address this risk, it's much more difficult and much more expensive if we don't. So let's drill down on that. I think we all know that old economic equation, climate change is going to happen to far off generations in far off places. It's more important to keep our economy strong today and let them worry about it in the future. The new equation is we as taxpayers are paying for climate change right now, and those costs are going to go up. And at the same time, the cost of mitigating that risk and moving to a cleaner carbon economy have dropped precipitously. So how are we paying for climate change as taxpayers? Well, we're paying in part to repair for what nature has been throwing at us. This graph is directly from Munich Re the leading reinsurance company in the world who began to warn about climate change all the way back in 1970. When they gave us a chart, their climate experts said that not every bar on this graph is due to climate change. Of course not. We've always had disasters. But what that expert and other climate scientists do say is that climate change is a threat multiplier. It is stacking the deck or loading the dice, making these losses more likely to happen and often more deadly and more expensive. And if you think that in 2017, we spent over $300 billion on natural disaster relief, that's three times what we spend on public education in this country. So they are real numbers and they're anticipated to get much larger in the future. And at the same time as we're repairing, from what nature just threw at us, we are also preparing for the new normal. What does that mean? It means spending $14.5 billion to build the Great Wall of Louisiana to protect New Orleans from the sea. It also means that Miami is considering $3.2 billion to, to create ocean gates to protect Miami and to raise its roads to keep it dry for a bit longer. The 
Army Corps of Engineers projects it needs almost three billion to protect the port and city of Norfolk. And New York City is evaluating seawalls that could cost up to 125 billion to protect the New York Harbor. So real numbers that taxpayers will pay for. And at the same time as those costs are rising, the cost of moving to a low carbon economy are dropping so rapidly. This graphic from Lazard, which is the industry expert on cost, shows that today, right now, on an unsubsidized apple to apple basis, the cheapest new way of creating energy around the world is solar, followed by wind, which are much cheaper than natural gas, followed by coal, followed by nuclear. This is true in two thirds of the world today, including in the world's leading emitters like America and China and India, and will be true everywhere in the world in the next five to 10 years. This is a game changer. In fact, in our own country last year, for the first time, we produced more electricity from renewables than from coal. And we know we could do more. We know the sky is the limit. Our own renewable energy lab projects that we could get 80% of our electricity generation from renewables by 2050. And with this shift, jobs are being created. As you can see from this graphic from the Department of Energy report, almost three quarters of all jobs in the power generation sector today come from green jobs, not from fossil fuels. And we know that other countries are spending even more than we are. In fact, China, which we know as the leading emitter and we know as the top polluter as we look at their air pollution issues, has at the same time put a stick in the sand and said that they want to be the singular global power in the new low energy arena. And they are outspending us two to one and they have 76% of, of the patents in new technologies. So they are really taking the forefront and we are falling behind. And developing countries are moving also to take the lead. As you can see from this graphic, today developing countries are investing more in clean energy than developed countries. And this is critical because that is where their economies are booming and their populations are growing and they need more energy. And the question is whether they can leapfrog over the fuels of the past directly to the fuels of the future. Just like they did with wireless technology around telecommunications, totally avoiding the wires and the poles and moving directly to cell phones and wireless communication. And while at our own federal level, we have kind of taken a few steps back, others are rushing in to pick up the mantle of leaderships. Cities, states, universities, and businesses are picking up that mantle. And they're not doing it because they're good guys. They're doing it because they see that climate change will directly and negatively impact the entities they are responsible for. But don't take our word for it. Take the words of our favorite breakfast company, General Mills, who wrote recently in their report, as a global food company, General Mills recognizes the risks that climate change presents to humanity, our environment, and our livelihoods. Changes in climate not only affect global food security, but also impact General Mills raw material supply, which in turn affects our ability to deliver quality finished product to our consumers and ultimately value to our shareholders. And it's not just General Mills. It is really all of the leading countries, uh, leading companies of the world. And we know what we need to do. We need to have more R&D, more investment, more innovation, things that all Americans can agree on. And we know that if we take our dollars and our innovation, we can make a difference. Scientists say that we have the technology to handle about 70% of this problem. And we have new technologies that are under development that potentially could help us with the rest. But we need to pivot in where we invest and where we spend our energies, whether we do it again in the fuels of the past or the technologies of the future. 
as has been said, we did not leave the Stone Age because we ran out of stones, but because we found something better. And we know there'll be great wealth created for those who come up with the innovation, much greater wealth than was created during the telecommunication revolution. And we know what works. We know what we need to invest in and, and to build out. The first thing is energy efficiency. It is the low hanging fruit. It's the way we save energy and save money. Whether it is through lighting or through retrofitting our building, it's the thing that it brings a return on investment first. Our own Empire State Building, when it was retrofitted, paid for itself in two years. We also know that we need to modernize and decarbonize our grid. Our grid system is similar to the road system before we built the highways. It is antiquated. It is not working well. It doesn't communicate well across regions. We know what we need to do. And once we build up its capacity, we also need to make sure that it is available to absorb more of the low carbon energy um, technology that is being developed. So part of that is also expanding our ability to store energy. And we have a picture of a cute little Tesla battery there on that wall. Batteries play a very important role, both at the utility level, but also at the individual level. Because if all of us have a battery like that on our garage wall or in our electric car, it means that in the future, a utility company could borrow 1% from all of us at a key peak uh, energy time instead of starting up a fossil fuel peaking plant. And it totally changes the relationship between the utility and the individual, making us both producers and both consumers. And once we electrify our grid, we need, once we clean and decarbonize our grid, we need to electrify everything. We need to electrify our transportation sector, not just our cars, but our garbage trucks, our buses, even our airplanes can be electrified, and also our home systems, our water heaters and our heating and cooling systems. But we know we need to use carbon for the short term. In order to protect our economy, we need to come down slowly. And in order to do that, we have to find a way to capture the carbon and keep it from going up into our atmosphere. And there's some very promising technologies to do that. This is a prototype up in Iceland that captures the carbon dioxide and pumps it down under basalt rock. And then when the water trickles down, it turns back into rock. Perhaps even more exciting is new negative emission technology. This is a plant over in Switzerland that literally sucks carbon dioxide out of the air and captures it and uses it for other purposes, including giving it to a Coca-Cola plant a few miles away to add fizz into their sodas. And there are other useful products we can make from carbon emissions. We can make things like plastics and fish food, and yes, there is a group who has even discovered how to create vodka using our emissions. And I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the role of nuclear. Many scientists say that we need to have a firm energy source like nuclear in the future. And there are ways to make it more flexible and more safer that many people are exploring. These smaller systems often um, shut down on the physics, the uh, properties of physics, not needing human intervention. Sometimes they use sodium instead of water for cooling. Sometimes they use thorium instead of uranium. The U.S. government um, military is looking into using these reactors near the front lines to give energy to our troops. And there are a lot of other countries that are looking to see how they could use these flexible nuclear um, systems. And we also should talk about some of the energy sources that have seemed out of reach, but that new advances in things like AI and lasers and other technologies are bringing within reach. And that is fusion and clean hydrogen. They would both provide abundant and clean sources that could be used across many different sectors. And we need to continue to think out of the box. This is a solar road over in France that partially um, energizes a nearby village. But the Chinese, who I mentioned want to be the leader, actually the sole um, 
big player in this area, has done one better. In their prototypical road, they have actually put electrodes on the road so that electric vehicles can self-charge as they drive over the road. And we must talk about the role of nature. We know that if we changed our practices, moved towards regenerating nature and doing um, different systems and using different systems in our agriculture and reforesting our lands and protecting our natural carbon uh, sinks where a lot of carbon is stored, we could do a lot to ameliorate this problem. In fact, experts think that if we change some of our practices, we could absorb almost 30% of the excess carbon in the air. But we are in a race. And right now, we are losing that race. As you can see from this graphic, on our current emissions path, we are headed to about seven degrees hotter by the end of this century. Now, let's think about that, guys. At seven degrees colder, what was our Earth like? We were in an ice age, right? What do we think it will be like when it's seven degrees hotter? We don't want to find out. But in order to do that, we need to bend the curve. We have to lessen our emissions immediately. And to do that, we need to come together. We need to have our technology experts and our scientists and our engineers working with our entrepreneurs, our financiers, our investors, and our corporations. And we need strong public support, and we need good policy. And the exciting thing is there is so much momentum in the first four areas. But where we are falling down is on public understanding and support and on strong federal policy, something that each and every one of us on this webinar can impact. So what can we do? Well, we need to demand more from ourselves, our communities, and our leaders. The first thing we need to do is to care. We need to think about this issue every day. We need to think about it every time we meet a new baby in a stroller and ask his or her name because they are going to be living on this planet when she is playing by very different rules. And they are going to grow up and look us in the eye and they are going to ask, what did you do? The second thing we need to do is to get energized. I can't tell you how many people say, oh, I'm so overwhelmed by this issue. What can anyone do? If a foreign country was coming to take as much land as we are about to lose to sea level rise and constant drought, we would be at war. If an asteroid was coming in mid-century that would really harm our food and water resources and endanger our children, we would be marching and demanding that our military and our scientists find a solution. Don't be intimidated. Only 8% of Americans deny the existence of climate change. Another 15% say they don't think it's such a big problem. 72% think that it is a major problem or a crisis. Yet who is driving policy at the federal level in this country? And it's because we are not raising our voices. Influence your policy leaders. And this is incredibly important no matter what side of the aisle you sit on. If you're a Democrat, recognize that many Democrats have given long time lip service to this issue, but really haven't accomplished that much on it. And that's in part because all of our politicians are elected and reelected from addressing short-term issues, not getting embroiled in difficult long-term ones. And if you sit on the conservative side, recognize that there are many conservatives who say they understand the risk. In fact, Kevin McCarthy, the congressional leader, has said that Republicans need to come and be forward-thinking on this issue because young Republicans and moderate Republicans care so deeply about this issue. But what they say is that they can't move on it because if they do, they'll be primary from the right and that they need their constituents to support them and to give them cover. So whichever side of the aisle you vote on, please raise your voice. Vote. It's the most important thing we can do. And we need to demand that all of our candidates have climate solutions. 
And lastly, it's important that we all take personal action. So what can we do? What can we do today? Well, the first thing we can do is contact our policy leaders. We know that if they get 10 phone calls, it's a very important issue. If they get 100, it's considered a tsunami. So definitely make that call, send that email. Second, call your mother-in-law. I don't know why, but whenever I travel the country, it always seems like it's mother-in-laws that are holdouts and deny the existence of climate change. And while this is a bit tongue in cheek, what we really mean is that we need to start talking to those around us, our loved ones, our neighbors, because we know that research shows that the number one way that people become under, into understanding around this issue is by hearing it from someone that they know and trust. So take this information and share it. Three, figure out your own carbon footprint, or perhaps schedule an energy audit to lessen the footprint of your home. Five, eat leftovers. About 40% of all of our food is wasted. And if you think about the energy that is used in growing it, transporting it, storing it, and then throwing it out into a landfill to create methane, it is an area that we can all impact easily and quickly. Four, start reading. Make sure that your information sources are varied and they come from nonpartisan groups. Groups like Scientific American or Financial Times if you are more business minded. The investment banks like Morgan Stanley have wonderful reports that show the economic cost of climate change and the benefits of moving to address the issue. Inside Climate News, the, uh, the Drawdown, which is a fabulous book outlining the mechanisms of lowering our carbon emissions and what works best. And of course, Climate Central, which is a wonderful resource to see what is happening in your area today and what is projected in the future. Sign up for green power through your utility if it is available. And lastly, write checks. Write checks to the not-for-profits that are doing such incredibly important work in this area. They are the boots on the ground and they need our support. Other action that we can take, upgrade our house by insulating, adding better appliances, perhaps moving towards solar or integrating geothermal. Look to use public transportation or a bike. But if you are going to buy a car, think about buying an electric car or at least a hybrid. Electric cars are so important in this transition. And in fact, by 2025, they are anticipated to be cheaper to buy and to own than a regular car because they have so many fewer parts, they'll be cheaper to manufacture. And because they have so many fewer parts, they're much cheaper to maintain. And if you've driven one, you'll know they are so much more fun to drive. Upgrade your diet, look to eat less meat and to buy more local food. That is a great way to cut down on our mission and support smart infrastructure in your community. Recognize that we have to build for the threats that are coming, not just look in the rear view mirror and build for the threats we've experienced in the past. Volunteer yourself within your community to address this issue and raise awareness and influence companies. Companies are driving so much of the change and they are listening to their customers, their employers, and their investors. And lastly, invite us back. Think of places where this message could have a positive effect for groups that perhaps aren't yet thinking about climate change as an issue that is pertinent to them. So in closing, we need to recognize that we are the first generation to understand the risks of climate change. We are the first generation to feel the brunt of it on our shoulders. We are the first generation to understand that we are leaving a damaged dystopian world for our kids and our grandkids. And we are the first generation to have the tools to do something about it. And the question for all of us on this webinar and all of us on this planet, is what will we choose to do? Thank you, and I really look forward to all of your questions. Tom, are you gonna come up and join me? I'm getting lonely up here.
Okay, so um, I don't see Tom coming up to join me. Um, there, Jane. How are you? Hi, this is Janie from the Princeton Public Library. Um, Tom, I don't know. I've invited him on. I'm not sure if he's not able to connect at this moment. These things happen with technology, as we all know. Um, if Becky is listening in, our tech uh, person from Princeton, can you work on getting Tom? on screen for us. In the meantime, we do have some really great questions here and I'm gonna just proceed. Um, the number one that has 10 upvotes is, does the pandemic help or hurt our ability to respond to climate change? Oh, wow. Let me start with a tough one, huh? That's got um, more votes today. So the pandemic yeah. is on everybody's mind. Of course it is. And it's a really interesting question and there, um, there's been a lot written on it. So, um, there is one group who believes that we can only handle one crisis at a time, and that while there was a lot of momentum around um, the uh, thought of addressing climate change coming into the virus, that the virus has really uh, sublimated that, that has really taken over our, our brain bandwidth, and that people really can't handle both. And that kind of happened during um, the last economic downturn where we lost a lot of territory as people focus more on the economic loss. There's another side of, or a different group of people who believe that we actually um, should be encouraged by what we are seeing in society's reaction to this threat. We are recognizing that we need to listen to scientists. We are, rec we are looking to institutions to keep us safe and finding them Incredible. We are willing to take action to keep others safe, acting more collectively. Um, and that with this infusion that will be coming into our economies as we try to right the economic ship, if we do it in ways that protect and build, again, the, ener the energy of the future and the jobs that are there. Um, I don't think people realize just how many jobs are in the clean tech sector. There are more jobs there than bankers or teachers. Um, that if we move to protect that, we can do both. And that we can actually help our economy, but also position us better to address this big issue of climate change. So I am an optimist, and I believe that the lessons we are learning from the pandemic and kind of people's mindset to realize that this earth is smaller and we have less control over nature than we once thought will actually put us in a better position but it's kind of the edge of a knife. We could go either which way. Okay, I like I like having optimism. Optimism is always, to me, the better way to go. Um, the second question is a bit longer, and it's and it had the most second most upvotes with six. Uh, even for those of us who are somewhat knowledgeable about the science behind destructive climate disruption, there's a lot of information uh, that's presented in much simpler, clearer terms than we're used to seeing. Um, so I, I think the question is, can we share it with friends and relatives who either know nothing about the underlying science or resist learning about it? And I believe this user is wanting to know if they can share this broadcast afterwards. Um, and if that's the correct question, you just type yes, um, because this is going to be available for replay. And so how much of this is something that you don't mind sharing widely? So our goal is to reach people who currently aren't thinking about this issue as pertinent to them. So we are eager to share any information that would be helpful. Um, we have not only this, we also have a video that is available to share that might be a little bit more, more fluid than a webinar version. We also have a five color brochure that has many of the charts and a lot of the scientific data that we share that if they um, have signed up for this webinar, we will send out to them as kind of a, a leave behind for them to have to share with their mother-in-law or their neighbor. Um, and they can always contact us. We also have a lot of robust information that we are adding to our, our website, which is currently being upgraded. Um, so we are trying to continuously provide information that is easy to digest and that is pertinent to a wide group of people as we go forward. So. Yes. Yes. And I just brought up, uh, for those of you that are here still, um, it's right above the ask a question function, um, a call to action button that says connect with us. And if you go to that, it's going to bring you to a nice static website um, that will directly link you to Climate Change 101, uh, uh, 
and J uh, Energy, the Conservation Foundation. And so that's a great way if you want to get these brochures or other links. Oh, and look, here's Tom. All right. right. Yay. Yay. I'm glad you're able to connect with us. So Tom, just so you know, we've already, um, oh, now we have, we've already done the first two questions about the pandemic and um, the one that had six upvotes. We're down to the one about how much can recycling help prevent climate change? So we've, we've that's where we are on the list. So I'm gonna make myself little and let Tom take over. So we're at this and I see that um, we've already had somebody talk about that a little bit in the in the comments section, but still, how much can recycling help prevent climate change? So Tom, do you have a comment on that or you'd like to share? Or do you want me to take it? Uh, go ahead, I, I thought the response from Charles was very good. Is there anything you wanna to add to that? I can't see it. Oh, okay. No Charles said uh, recycling is more about materials recovery than it is about carbon and climate change. Um, the transition from fossil fuels for, for transport and domestic and business use is what will offer the most uh, reduction in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, but don't stop recycling. So I think that's a good answer. Anything you wanna add there? Um, it's a great answer. The one thing I will say is that as the oil companies project forward, they are projecting to increase their production of using petroleum to create more plastics. So um, it, it is tied together um, and they do see it as a, a revenue source. So it is um, important to continue to recycle and let them know that that's not where we want to go. Great. So the next question is, is um, somewhat related to the the first one, how is climate change expected to affect the spread of infectious diseases? Um, so that's a really good one, and I'm not a doctor, um, and I don't even play one on TV, but I will do my best. Uh, so one of the things that we know is that um, climate change impacts habitat, which means that uh, more wild animals are coming into contact with humans, and some of these diseases that start in animals, as is believed this pandemic, um, will be more likely to cross that barrier as the, two, the species interface more. The other thing that's important is I think um, the fact that a lot of diseases that we thought we had beat, at least in our country, um, like malaria are, are coming back because um, our, our climate systems are changing. And so if you look at some of the projections by 2050, much of our southeastern coast all the way up into the Carolinas is anticipated to be threatened by malaria once again. Um, so there, there's clear link between disease and climate change, and, and uh, there's a lot written about that, um, both in the CDC and at other sites. And, and the other thing I, I, I would add here is uh, people may have seen a very recent study that came out from Harvard University that found a linkage between the areas that have suffered uh, the worst air pollution um, and the um, uh, mortality rate from COVID-19, unfortunately. And so the linkage is that when we burn these fossil fuels, it not only is emitting greenhouse gases, but it emits a variety of co-pollutants that, that um, pollute our air and cause health problems, particulate matter in particular. And so this study found that those areas with higher rates of uh, particulate matter are, are seeing higher uh, death rates from COVID-19. So there's a, a very real, um, and present and, and uh, unfortunate linkage that we're seeing play out, you know, right now in this crisis. Um, so we're, we're we're running short on time. We have just a few minutes left. And, and the last question, I think, um, I want to use as a bit of a segue to talk about uh, the presentations that are uh, that are, are forthcoming. So um, the next question is: How is New Jersey leading the way to deal with climate change and, and clean energy? And um, I'll share a thought on that and would love to hear yours as well, Kathleen. Um, so, you know, New Jersey really over the past couple of years in particular has uh, moved to the forefront as one of those those other parties leading the way that you referred to, Kathleen, in your in your slide. Um, things like um, rejoining the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, um, joining the uh, U.S. Climate Alliance, the Alliance of States that are kind of taking matters into their own hands. Um, and also moving very, very aggressively to towards that clean energy future that you laid out, that you described and showed is, is very achievable and, and, and it's affordable and will bring so many economic benefits 
to the state. Um, and so uh, we've been working very closely with the administration on a new energy master plan designed to achieve 100% clean energy by by 2050. And um, that's a topic that we want to get into uh, in, in the next session that we hope to do along with the New Jersey League of Conservation Voters to really hone on hone in on how New Jersey is becoming a, a real clean energy energy leader nationally um, and uh, what's happening uh, the policy front in New Jersey and how people can get involved. So uh, anything you want to add to that question? Um, yeah, I guess the only thing I would add is one of the things that I think New Jersey is doing well is looking at the, at, at the broad range of um, action needed. And I think that, you know, a lot of us sometimes hope for that silver bullet, that there's one thing that we could all do that could make this problem um, go away or, or be less significant. And the, the answer truly is that we have to do so many different things and we need to get moving on it quickly. Um, and I think that that's one of the things I've been impressed with with the New Jersey plan most recently. Um, looking not just at energy or electricity, but also at transportation um, and also at how our buildings are using energy and whether the efficiency is there. And so um, it's been exciting to see the leadership in the state um, in moving to address it in a robust way. It has, and it uh, gives me and I think a lot of people hope, um, and I hope it does for those of you listening as well. So with that, we're going to close. Um, this is such a, a, a rich topic. We could we could go on forever, but um, we're going to let you get back to uh, to your days. And um, I want to thank uh, uh, Kathleen and and Sea Change Conversations in particular for just this incredible content that you are making available to uh, to all of us and to so many people around the country. It's it's so it's so important and valuable. And I want to thank our uh, our, our co-hosts um, with Princeton Public Library. I want to thank all of you for joining us on the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Please uh, stay in touch with us. Um, stay connected with us using the connect with us button below, and we will keep you posted on future presentations that are uh, in the works. Thank you. Um, I, hi, so yes, I want to wrap up and say um, thanks again to Kathleen for what a great presentation. Uh, to Tom, and there's many on this call who help behind the scenes with the arrangements like uh, Barb Webb and Carrie Dykeman and all of the, the great presenters um, to make this special presentation available for uh, Earth Day. And I also will uh, let you know that we have a really special event coming up on Friday um, about the story of plastic here on Crowdcast with the library with the director of that really important film. Um, and if you want to view that film, it's on Discovery today at 2 p.m. But if you can't view it there, um, I think I just sent a link. If you e email the library, we can send you a link so you can view it on your own. Yeah. So um, it says, please consider attending this. Um, if you want to be able to uh, preview this really great documentary, contact the library. We have a link to send you and then come back Friday night for the conversation and continue this Earth Day conversation. And I'm really looking forward to future events with Sea Change and with the New Jersey Conservation Foundation and We Think Energy New Jersey in the future. Thank you again, Tom. Thank you, Kathleen. And thank you to the 120 or so people that logged on at some point today to view this uh, session with us. Terrific. Okay. Take Any care. Everyone. Words, Tom? Take care, everyone. Be well. Okay. I agree. Take care and be well. And thank you, Kathleen.